uh, appears we're live on Facebook. So um, welcome. It's uh, Sunday, August the 25th, the online Gurdjieff group. And uh, we're going to be talking about C influences, conscious influences uh, today in a continuation of the discussion that we had last week. Um, but before we do that, let's just uh, go around and uh, see how everyone's doing. Um, Brian, how are things in Scottsdale, Arizona? Nice and warm there? Uh, yeah, things are going really well. Um, about 110 in the coming out to the end of August. Looking forward okay. to uh, spring coming in for sure. That's about, I think, 40 degrees, um, I believe. And uh, the rest of the world, it's quite, it's quite hot. Um, so you yeah. just stay inside and or melt um yep that's the goal i mean just try to uh you know stay uh in the ac as much as possible then you know try to get the you know mostly try to get their vacations in in july or august yeah try to escape it a little bit but uh it could be tough uh, we we had a really really hot day here last week in toronto on tuesday and then suddenly all the power went out. And I'm thinking, oh no, because uh, this happened years ago because of all the air conditioning and everything. And it was just this massive power outage years ago. But fortunately this time it was just my neighborhood. And, uh, but for a while they're not knowing how far the outage extended, uh, thinking maybe I was using my air conditioning too much. And, uh, um, Karen, how are things down there? Uh, still a little too dry in Mexico? You no, know, it started to rain. We had a couple of torrential rains. It's beautiful. Uh, I'm expecting some storms today. Lovely. Everything's growing beautifully. It's okay. so green. That's good. Uh, Ian, <coughs> your microphone is off, I guess. Uh, uh, how are things in Portland, Oregon? Uh, things are good. Things are good. It's starting to get a little cold. Um, I don't know if we're getting a bit of early fall weather or if it's just a bit of a strange thing, but uh, I noticed this morning the sun was still coming up as I was heading down here, so the days are getting shorter. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've started to notice it myself in terms of the, uh, when I take Philo out for a walk, it's no longer sunny. Uh, it's dusk, you know, and uh, in a, about a month it's going to be really dark. So um, just being, you know, this far north, we're a little bit farther north than you. One of the things that surprised me when I moved to England, I lived at a place called New York, and it's sort of on level with James Bay, Hudson's Bay, the bottom of Hudson's Bay. And, you know, the, in the winter time, they would get eight hours of light and 16 hours of darkness. And in the summertime, it would be the opposite. So um, I had never been that far north before. And we, we used to, uh, when I first started this, we had uh, um, uh, 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 a Norwegian. And I remember talking to him one night, and it was 10.30 his time, and the sun was streaming in his window uh, in the summertime. So, uh, um, but then he was quite far north in uh, Norway. Um, Angelica, um, the, the, the city, Sao Paulo, darkness um, for an hour last week uh, because of the burning fires. Um, what was that like? Oh. <laughs> uh, what is, is uh, for me, uh, when I, I live uh, 40 kilometers away from downtown, but here was also dark, and in the forest, more dark, total dark. And uh, uh, the, the, the frequency around was uh, dense and tension, 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 tension. Dense and tension. Uh, but I was, uh, I was calm and yeah. no birds, uh, no, no birds uh, sing, uh, dogs, total silence. Uh, the animals, uh, they stop absolutely, but I guess 10 minutes before darkness, you know. I was here and then I felt my dog was strange and quiet. 
in silence, no birds, no monkeys, no nothing. And then 10 minutes after this, uh, the darkness came. And uh, I only sit here and wait <laughs> for don't know what, but I sit with my dog because we couldn't do not so much things. But uh, the communication, uh, internet, cell phone, words, and all city in despair and people oh, will be end of the world, we will <laughs> die at this and that. And this point for me was uh, uh, a good experience. <laughs> and when things come so close to your life, uh, essence, and then maybe you can get the enlightenment, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> people are in despair, world will be finished, and I hope it's interesting to see what we are doing with the planet. Yeah. Why things so dark are happening? What we do and do to, to give uh, more compassion for the others, the planet, and so I, I think the, you know, the forest fires that are raging in your country, um, particularly in the Amazon, this is, it seems to be like a shock for the rest of the world. Um, people, the news, people seem to be taking this whole environmental thing just a little bit more seriously. Um, you know, the, the, the world leaders are the world leaders. The, the G7, they're meeting, um, they, you know, they're pushing it to the top of the agenda. Um, they, they want to include, you know, the preservation of forests as, uh, you know, a global resource, something that we need. Um, so hopefully some good will come out of this. But just in terms of yourself, to be somewhere, I, I, I've uh, gone through a couple of uh, solar eclipses. And we were prepared for that, and suddenly the darkness, but how everything gets quiet. Um, the mm -hmm. light, the birds, the animals. Um, I'm not quite, I, I would, you know, when, when I experienced them, I was never quite in a uh, sort of forested area like you are uh, to notice it. But that must have really given you an opportunity to self-remember and to become aware and uh, to even ponder uh, some of the deeper issues of life. Um, just as, a, as everything quieting down and the, just also realizing that the emotional fervor, the temperature of the people around you sort of rising and people thinking that there's something apocalyptic about it, and uh, mm -hmm. um, you know the, the the sort of the slight degree of mass hysteria um, that we don't get off, we don't get that much of a chance, fortunately, to experience that. Um, I know that when Mr. Gurdjieff was talking to Uspensky, it was during the First World War, and there was a lot of that mass hysteria and waves of emotions sweeping across and then also with the, the Mr. Gurdjieff and uh, uh, the group of them being in Russia during the revolution um, just experienced in this kind of emotion so it must have been somewhat interesting being there uh, just observing yourself observing your own state observing the sound of nature or the lack of sound and the darkness and um, you know, the, the, the responses of uh, the people around you. Um, one of those times that, you know, for, for good self-observation and good recording of our self-interior, the world around us. And uh, um, so uh, I'm going to uh, just uh, bring up, um, you know, the work. We're doing this work for ourselves. Um, we're doing this work for mankind, 
and we are doing this work for the earth herself. Um, you know, just uh, uh, to Catherine Hulm, uh, Mr. Gurdjieff told her, do not become identified with your body. You do not really own your body. You have possession of it. Your body belongs to the earth. It's the planetary body, which was a word that he used in tales. So what we do to the earth also affects our body. Our body is composed of the earth. It comes from the earth. It's fed by the earth, and it will go back to the earth. Then the, the work for mankind. He told Catherine Hume, again, do not become identified with your essence. It's not your essence. It's really human essence. And my metaphor is like a glass of water. And a drop is taken out of the glass of water. And we are that drop. But that drop goes back into the water. So when we work on ourselves, we also work on our essence. Uh, so we work for humanity as well. And then we work for ourselves, that a bit of the work comes back to ourselves. Uh, J.G. Bennett said that a third of what we do returns to ourselves. Uh, a third is used up in the process, and a third goes for some other purpose. Um, I like to think of that, you know, a third is returned to myself, a third is for the benefit of humanity, and a third is for the benefit of this planet herself. Uh, we're not just separate from this planet, we belong to the planet. Our physical body is of the planet, and, you know, as we do to the planet, so do we do to our physical body. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff's uh, wish or vow, I wish to be, I can be, I have the right to be, I have the ability to be, I swear to myself that this will never be for my personal profit, but to help others. I wish to be to help others. And Let's just become aware of our body. Let's just become aware of gravity. Sensing gravity on our body, and I apologize. You might not hear it as much as I do, but they're vacuuming upstairs. Um, as I understand it, I've listened to some of the recordings. It's not that noticeable, but it is to me. Um, so let's just become aware of our body. Become aware of gravity pulling our body down. Become aware of the pressure points. Um, where our sitting bones are, um, become aware of the uh, where our feet are touching the ground. Um, just become aware of the general pull of gravity on our body. And then become aware of balance. Notice how your head is balanced on your neck, which is balanced on your shoulders, balanced on your spine. Uh, balanced on your pelvic bones, which is balanced on the seat. Then become aware of the atmospheric pressure around you. We actually have parts of our brain that are specifically devoted to the awareness of the atmospheric pressure around us. Uh, when we live in a sort of a flat area where there's not a lot of mountains or hills, we're not really that aware of it, except when... Um, the, the barometric pressure lowers and storms come, and some people notice it in their joints and their knees and whatever. But try to become aware of the pressure of the air around you. And then try to become aware of the temperature of the air around you, as well as the temperature inside your body. Try to notice the difference between the temperature inside your body and the temperature of the air around you. Now we also have various nerve nodes, um, for instance, in our throat, inside our body. So if something gets stuck in our throat, we're very, very aware of it. As well as our esophagus, um, if food gets trapped in our esophagus, uh, we want to know about it. We've got special nerve nodes in our stomach. Again, you know, if we've eaten something wrong or something bad, we want to be aware of our stomach. 
We also have uh, you know, special nerve nodes in our bladder uh, if we have to go to the toilet in our colon. And it is possible to become aware of specific organs and things like that within our body, but Mr. Gurdjieff doesn't recommend it because when we bring our conscious awareness to something going on with inside ourselves, we alter the tempo and regulation of that uh, thing that we're focusing on. And we're like this intricate clock and a change in one area will affect other areas and it will expand outwards. So just this general awareness of the inside of our body, this general sensation of the inside of our body. And then become aware of the outside of your body. Uh, become aware of the touch of clothing on your body. Uh, maybe you're wearing socks or shoes or bare feet. Um, become aware of pants, shirts, uh, the air that touches your face, hair on your head. Perhaps become aware of any jewelry that you may have on your body. We can even go so far as to notice the difference in texture and weave, say from our pants to our shirt and become aware of those differences. So when we become aware of these different sensory aspects of our body, the position of our body in space, the expansion and contraction of our rib cage, the sensation of air flowing in and out, the movement of our diaphragm, abdomen, the muscles between our ribs. We are actually in this moment lawfully using uh, C12. C12 is coming into contact with so 48 on the octave of food, and it's manifesting as La 24, which is the sensation. When we sense our hands, when we become aware of our hands and our fingers and the muscles and bones in our hands, this awareness, this ability to perceive our hands consciously is fueled by La 24. And for La 24 to arise, the higher must blend with the lower. So C12 must blend with so 48 in order to manifest in this sensory awareness. So let's just become aware of our body. Become aware of the sensation of self. And then let's just become aware and divide our attention and focus on our right shoulder, particularly the flesh in our right shoulder. And then focus on the flesh in our right upper arm, the flesh in our right lower arm, the flesh in our hands, the flesh in our thumb, right thumb, index finger, middle finger, fourth finger, baby finger. And then let's move to the flesh in our right hip, the flesh in our right upper leg, the flesh in our right lower leg, the flesh in our right foot, and then the flesh in our right big toe, second toe, middle toe, uh, fourth toe, and baby toe. And then let's move over to the left side and going back up. Let's start with the flesh in our left baby toe, our left fourth toe, middle toe, second toe, our left big toe, becoming aware of the flesh in our left foot, our left lower leg, our left upper leg right up to our hip, and then moving into our left arm, starting with our left baby finger, fourth finger, middle finger, index finger, our left thumb, then moving into the flesh in, our left hand, and then moving up our left arm, our left lower arm, and our left upper arm. And then bring our attention down to our pelvic region and become aware of the flesh in our pelvic region. 
And then let's move up our into our lower torso. So to become aware of the various internal organs, the uh, um, the large intestines, the small intestines, the muscles in our abdomen, uh, our lower back, moving into our middle back. So aware of the flesh in our middle back, the flesh in our solar plexus, and then moving up to our chest. So the flesh in our back, upper back, uh, in our heart, our lungs, moving right to the front of our chest, becoming aware of the flesh in our upper torso, and then moving up into the flesh in our neck, and then the flesh in our head. So our tongue, our cheeks, the skin, the fleshy parts. Try to become aware of this flesh self. Try to become aware of all of the fleshy part of your body, all of the flesh. And then let's move into the bones. Let's start with the bone, the right shoulder, uh, the right upper arm. Become aware of the bone in the right upper arm. Become aware of the two bones in the right lower arm. Become aware of the bones in our hands. And, you know, our thumb bone, there's actually three bones for each digit. So become aware of the bones for your right thumb. And they extend right into your palm, the bones for your right index finger, the bones for your right middle finger, the bones for your right fourth finger, and the bones for your right baby finger. And then become aware of your right upper leg, the main thigh bone. And then moving down to the two bones in your right lower leg. And then moving down into the bones in your feet, particularly the three bones that go right into the soles of your feet for your big toe. And again, the bones for your second right toe, the bones for your middle toe, the bones for your fourth toe, the bones for your baby toe. And then moving over to the left side, become aware of the bones for your left baby toe, the three bones that extend right into the sole of your foot, uh, the bones for the fourth toe, the bones for the middle toe, the bones for the second toe, and the bones for your big toe. And then become aware of all of the bones in your feet. And then moving up to the two bones in your lower leg, your left lower leg, the bone in your right upper leg, uh, then moving to the three bones in your left baby finger, extending right up into the palm, the bones for your fourth uh, finger, the bones for your left middle finger, the bones for your left index finger, the bones for your left thumb, and then become aware of all of the other bones in your left hand. And then moving up uh, the two bones in your left lower arm. And then become aware of the bones in your left upper arm. And then move down to your pelvis. Become aware of your pelvic bones. And then moving up your spine. Just slowly allow your awareness to move up the bones in your spine. So the lower part of your spine and the lumbar region to the middle of your back, moving up your spine right to your shoulders. And then allow your awareness to go back into your shoulder blades. And then become aware of your rib cage and the bones in your ribs. And then become aware of your breastbone right in the very front of your chest. And then your collarbone. And then the bones in your neck, the cervical vertebrae moving up. And then become aware of your jawbone. And then become aware of the bone, the facial bone with your upper teeth. And then become aware of the occipital bone in the back of your skull, the temporal bones in the sides of your skull, the frontal bone just underneath behind your forehead, and the parietal bone at the top of your head. And then let's move inwards a little bit more. And we have both yellow 
and red marrow. Uh, the yellow marrow produces white blood cells. The red marrow produces red blood cells. The yellow marrow are found in our long bones. So our arms and our legs are the source of the yellow marrow. So do your best. Try to become aware of the yellow marrow in your right upper arm. The yellow marrow in your right lower arm the yellow marrow in your right upper leg, the yellow marrow in your right lower leg, the yellow marrow in your left lower leg, the yellow marrow in your left upper leg, the yellow marrow in your left lower arm, the yellow marrow in your left upper arm. And then moving into the red marrow contained within your pelvic bones. The red marrow contained within your spine, the lower part of your spine, uh, the middle part, the, your upper back. And then become aware of the red marrow in your shoulder blades, the red marrow in your ribs your breastbone, your collarbone, the red marrow in your cervical vertebrae, the vertebrae the, uh, in your neck, and then become aware of the red marrow in your jawbone, your facial bone, the, the upper facial bone with your teeth, the red marrow in the occipital bone in the back of your skull, the temporal bones in the side of your skull, the frontal bone behind your forehead, and the parietal bone on top of your head. And then, you know, try to sense the marrow in your bones, and then move out and try to sense your bones, and then move out and try to sense your flesh. Sensing marrow, bones, and flesh. And the interesting thing about sensation is we can sense deeper and deeper parts of our body, but we can also extend sensation outwards from our body. So just bring your focus to your body. Try to sense your body as fully as you can. Try to sense your whole body from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, sensing flesh, bones, and marrow, really getting an awareness of the sensation of self. And then, whatever, wherever you are, the building that you are in, try to extend your ability to sense into the building. Try to expand this sensation so that your sense you sense the whole building and if you live in a city like i do try to sense next your neighborhood or if you're in the country try to sense the area around you try to extend your sense your ability to sense a couple of hundred feet maybe a hundred meters and then try to expand your ability to sense even further. Try to do it for your geographical location. For me in Toronto on the Great Lake, try to sense Southern Ontario, the northern part of New York. Uh, try to extend it perhaps, uh, you know, 100 miles, 120 kilometers. Then Try to expand your sensation to your continent. Try to become aware of the continent that you're on. And then expand your sensory awareness to the earth. Try to sense the earth. And then try to sense the solar system. Try to move your awareness and become aware of that, what Mr. Gurdjieff called the planetary realm the solar system. 
and then try to expand your sensation into the galaxy and into the entire universe. And then let's just slowly bring it back to the galaxy, to the solar system, to the earth, to your continent, to uh, 100 miles around you, 120 kilometers, back to your neighborhood, your area, back to the building you're in, and back to your body. And I should say I've uh, conflated a number of exercises that I was taught when I was in a Gurdjieff Bennett group about sensing, moving inwards to the ultimately to the marrow, and then another one moving the sensation out to the edges of the universe. So I was just doing this to show that, you know, the sensation of self is very important, but we can also move it inwards and move it outwards. So let's finish with the collected state exercise. As the earth is surrounded by an atmosphere, so too are we surrounded by an atmosphere. Collect your atmosphere. Draw it in around you, perhaps a meter, meter and a half, four to six feet. Keep it collected. Keep it contained. Keep it tranquil. Keep it still. Become aware of the actual border of your atmosphere. And we can disturb our atmosphere through our thoughts, through our sensations, and through our feelings. So keep your thoughts tranquil. Keep your sensations tranquil. Keep your feelings tranquil. Keep this atmosphere tranquil. And in a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, breathe the atmosphere in. And then as you breathe out, imagine something remains, some emanations remain that begin to settle within you. One, two, three. Breathe it in, and then as you breathe out, imagine something remains. And silently, in your mind, repeat after me. May results from this exercise. be transubstantiated within me or my being. And then just slowly return. I mean, as I said, I brought together a bunch of exercises that I did years ago in a Bennett group. Um, you know, some of them were, you know, there was even one where we, there are seven different layers to our skin. And one exercise that was purely devoted to starting with the outer layer of our skin and attempting to move our awareness slowly more inwards to the inner layer of our skin or our, our, our epidural. And um, other exercises devoted to becoming aware of the flesh self then becoming aware of the bone self, and then becoming aware of the marrow self. And I have to say the, the bone marrow self, I took that one step further because I went on to you know, Google University and looked up marrow and realized that you know, we have red marrow and white marrow. And so I've incorporated that into the way that I do it. Um, the long bones are where we have our yellow marrow and the smaller bones are where we have our red marrow. Um, but very much in the Gurdjieff tradition, moving inwards. And then the moving outwards. I believe actually with the moving outwards, we did it, you know, seven steps to the ultimate uh, uh, edge of the universe. And, uh, um, you know, I just do it ourself, the building we're in, the neighborhood, the geographical locale, the continent, the earth, the solar system, the galaxy, and the universe. Um, just attempting to expand our ability to sense this awareness. Um, I know that my father had a, a special ability to sense. He could walk into a room, and if someone was hiding in the room, he could sense their presence. 
And as a kid, I tested him over and over. And I would be hiding behind the couch or behind the curtains. And he could sense me. Um, it was, you know, so the ability, we, we can sense more than our body. So that's what I wanted to try and illustrate today uh, with this exercise. Um, I've got all your microphones muted. Let me unmute them. Any comments on this um, before we uh, start talking about sea influences? Any? I mean, it's pretty easy to sense our bones to a degree. A little bit more difficult to um, sense the marrow. Uh, oh, someone's dog is barking. Uh, not mine, he's sleeping. <laughs> it's yours, oh, okay. Whoops, I didn't unmute you. Oh, you're still muted. It doesn't really matter. Um, so today, C influences. Let me go back to um, my uh, PDF reader. Um, so the, the, the question from William, part of it last week, well, it was a multi-pronged question. Um, when I answered the first part, uh, he came up with the second part. Um, quite right. This is in part what I was getting at, uh, which is the ability to tune into higher impressions. And as I said last week, the most we can tune in to is hydrogen 24, uh, ray 24 of the octave of impressions, and we do that through the process of self-remembering. And this is the best we can do at the start. As we begin to develop, we can access higher and higher impressions. But for the normal person to become aware of your eyes receiving energy, your ears receiving sound, your taste buds receiving taste, your nose, uh, the receptors in your nose smelling, um, these are ways to feed on Ray24 of the octave of impressions, to feed on higher impressions through the mindful awareness of our eyes taking in light, our ears taking in sound, our uh, um, olfactory receptors taking in smell, and our taste buds taking in taste. <coughs> but William was also, you know, because I was talking about the misuse of C12, he was interested in how we can properly use the intellectual and emotional centers for uh, what they're designed to do, rather than focusing on their misuse to focus more on their correct use. And so I talked about that last week, but there was a question that had to do with um, the pages 199 to 204 in In Search of the Miraculous. And so I'll read his question here. Um, this is in part what I was getting at. Um, also, when you read pages 199 to 204, yes, In Search of the Miraculous, which talk about A, B, and C influences, it all falls into place. B influences can be transmitted via the written word in a novel, poem, or scientific text, etc. I would imagine that each work could have greater or lesser degree of B influence. The Bible would be an example, that is, the work a work that is high in B influence. From what I'm reading, B influences are higher influences created outside of life and introduced into life where a man can receive more or less of these influences. If he separates the first kind and the second kind of influences and accumulates them, this could be the beginning of a magnetic center. Hence the question about a influences created within life itself, uh, news, social media, and higher B influences. Um, so page 199 to 204 of In Search of the Miraculous. Um, so this is Uspensky writing. Um, G is, of course, Mr. Gurdjieff. Once there was a meeting with a large number of people who had not been at our first meeting before. One of them asked, from what does the way start? 
The person who asked the question had not heard G's description of the four ways, and he used the word way in the usual religious mystical sense. The chief difficulty in understanding the idea of the way, said G, consists in the fact that people usually think that the way, he emphasized this word, starts on the same level on which life is going. This is quite wrong. The way begins on another much higher level. This is exactly what people do not understand. The beginning of the way is thought to be easier or simpler than it is in reality. I will try to explain this in the following way. Man lives in life under the law of accident and under two kinds of influences again governed by accident. And here I want to point out uh, what really distinguishes, or one of the things that really distinguishes this system from a lot of New Age pablum out there is this understanding of the law of accident. You talk to people who've ingested a lot of New Age pablum, and they say everything that happens to us was meant to happen. And, you know, everything has purpose and meaning. Um, nothing just happens. And according to this system, most people operate under the law of accident, where things really do just happen. You know, you apply to various schools. And you just happen to get accepted to one of them. You go into that school, uh, you decide that you're going to take all these courses, they fit into your schedule, and you just happen to meet your future spouse in one of those courses. There's nothing predestined, predetermined about that. Most people's lives are really ruled by the law of accident. Now, Mr. Gurdjieff said that we can also move up and be ruled by the law of fate, which is different than accident, or we can move outside of accident. But most sleeping people, most of humanity, mechanical men, people who are centered in world 48, are ruled by the law of accident. Someone smiles at them and they're happy and another person frowns at them and they get upset. And it's just like this robotic realm where people are not really present and things just happen to them. So man lives in life under the law of accident and under two kinds of influences, again, governed by accident. The first kind are influences created in life itself or by life itself. Influences of race, nation, country, climate, family, education, society, profession, manners and customs, wealth, poverty, current ideas, and so on. So it's kind of hard to accept and hard to 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 recognize that so much of us, so much of that has gone into our development is really more or less the result of a series of accidents. It's not purposeful. Uh, there, there's no dramatic movement in our life upwards that things just happen. The second kind are influences created out Side this life, influences of the inner circle or esoteric influences, influences that is created under different laws, although also on the earth. These influences differ from the former, first of all, in being conscious in their origin. This means they have been created consciously 
by conscious men for a definite purpose. And here I also want to point out something uh, in this, where, you know, talking about the esoteric inner or esoteric circle. Um, when Mr. Gurdjieff first started uh, bringing these teachings to the West, the Theosophical Society was sort of blooming at its peak. And there were Theosophical organizations throughout the world. And one of the first places that he went was to these Theosophical organizations. And that's where he found um, some of his first uh, 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 students. Um, and Madame Blavatsky and all of them, they believed that there were, you know, this, this group, this hidden inner group of humanity um, exerting an influence on humanity. And uh, so I believe, my own personal belief is that he took this idea and he used this idea. There's a lot of allure in the idea that there are hidden esoteric centers, you know, guiding human life, releasing information out into the world. Um, and I think he played with this idea probably a little bit more than he should have, but you know, who am I to say that? Um, it was really, really vogue back then to think there was this hidden inner esoteric circle. And um, there are certainly these influences out in the world, but uh, this, this had a particular allure back in the time that he was uh, recruiting students in 1915. Um, even through the 1920s, A.R.R. AR Raj uh, came through the Theosophical Society. So this was one of their, their, their core fundamental tenets. So let's just, you know, as I scroll back up, um, Bring your attention back to your body, back to your breathing, back to the sensation of self. Be here as you are watching this, as you are reading this. Try to keep a portion of your attention focused on the sensation of self, on your body. So these influences differ from the former, first of all, in being conscious in their origins. This means that they have been created consciously by conscious men for a definite purpose. Influences of this kind are usually embodied in the form of religious systems and teachings, philosophical doctrines, works of art, and so on. They are let out into life for a definite purpose and become mixed with influences of the first kind. But it must be borne in mind that these influences are conscious only in their origin. Coming into the general vortex of life, they fall under the general law of accident and begin to act mechanically. That is, they may act on a certain definite man or may not act. They may reach him or they may not. In undergoing change and distortion in life through transmission and interpretation, influences of the second kind are transformed into influences of the first kind. That is, they become, as it were, merged into the influence of the, of the first kind. So they get merged, uh, excuse me, into the law of accident. <coughs> excuse me. Um, those of you who have been uh, Facebook friends of mine for a long time know that I have this peculiar belief that the Old Testament, particularly the Tanakh, which is the, the Torah plus about two thirds of the Old Testament, uh, was the product of a Babylonian mystery school. In uh, Beelzebub Tales to his grandson, Mr. Gurdjieff talks about a mythological king who heard that he could transform lead into gold. And he called all the wise people in his kingdom to come and tell him how to do this. And none of them came up with the answer. And then he went further and brought all the wise people from other places and they couldn't come up with the answer. And then he began to conquer territories and brought the wise men from those conquered territories to Babylon and they didn't know the answer. And then he gave up. 
on seeking this question. But these people, they weren't exactly slaves, but they were, in a sense, brought into captivity. But they were able to own property, work. Uh, they were able to form societies. And Mr. Gurdjieff talked about the development, I'll probably pronounce it wrong, legomononisms, and trying to embed ancient teachings and things such as dances, carpet weaving, art, uh, uh, various different things. And the interesting thing is that he locates it historically through the addition of one particular individual. And the individual was Pythagoras. And Pythagoras was a Greek who went to Egypt, became an Egyptian priest, and when he was an Egyptian priest, Babylon conquered Egypt, and then they brought all the Egyptian priests to Babylon. And so you had all of these mystical schools that had been separated, all brought together, and then left alone. And they began to realize their close connections with each other. Um, it's a very important part of tales. Uh, so Pythagoras, who was a Greek, who was an Egyptian priest, was also initiated into the Chaldean mysteries. And there was this mystical hothouse and a way of embedding these conscious influences in dance, in carpet weaving, in various different things. And this was actually where the Tanakh was written at this exact period in history. So I believe that the, at least the first two-thirds of the Old Testament was one of these legomenonisms written by a conscious group of men. So it was certainly the bee influence that was set out into life. And we can see where the Bible is today. We can see the misuse of the Bible, how it's sort of been distorted. Um, so we can look at this process through the examination of the Bible. Um, so these, you know, uh, C influences, they create B influences, they put them out into life. And, you know, people turn these B influences into A influences, the influences within life. And, uh, you know, we can see the distortion of the Bible. Uh, we just have to look to, you know, the evangelical movement, um, particularly within America and Christian nationalism and stuff to realize how these really, really, really high influences, when they're sent out into the world, can be distorted over time. Um, if we think about this, we shall see that it is not difficult for us to distinguish influences created in life from influences whose source lies outside life. To enumerate them, to make up a catalog of one and the other is impossible. It is necessary to understand, and the whole thing depends on this understanding. We have spoken about the beginning of the way. The beginning of the way depends precisely upon this understanding or upon the capacity for discriminating between the two kinds of influences. Of course, their distribution is unequal. One man receives more of the influences whose source lies outside life, another less. A third is almost isolated from them. But this cannot be helped. This is already faith. And here, uh, elsewhere in In Search of the Miraculous and in the uh, teachings that were presented in views from the real world, uh, which lists Mr. Gurdjieff as the author, but it was compiled from notes taken by his students after his death by Madame uh, uh, de Salzman. Uh, there's a distinction between the law of accident and the law of fate. Um, and then there's getting beyond fate. Uh, so some people are governed completely by the law of accident, and others a little bit more by the law of fate. Um, fate is different than accident, but it's not free will. It's sort of a movement up to 
higher influences, but it's not that complete freedom. So, you know, the, he talks about that this is fate. It's fate that one man receives more of the conscious influences, another less, and a third almost nothing. Speaking in general and taking normal life under normal conditions and a normal man, conditions are more or less the same for everybody. That is, to put it more correctly, difficulties are equal for everybody. And here, if you notice, he stepped on, you know, taking normal life under normal conditions and a normal man. He's really stepping on the word normal. For a normal human being, um, they're sort of trapped in the same quagmire. And the difficulty lies in separating the two kinds of influences. If a man in receiving them does not separate them, that is, does not see or does not feel their difference, their action upon him is also also is not separated. That is, they act in the same way, on the same level, and produce the same results. So this is basically saying a normal human being can, say, pick up the Bible, um, a product of C influences, and it doesn't affect them in that way. They, they don't make those deeper connections. They read it in a completely different way than another man who is able to separate these influences. And we can expand this concept of see influences. You know, we can assume that, say, someone like the Buddha was a conscious individual, enlightened. And so the influences that he set off in the world, you know, 600 BC, had in their origins were conscious. But then we also know about Buddhism that the Buddhist texts, the writings that uh, form the basis of Buddhism, weren't written down for at least 400 years after the death of the Buddha. So within those writings, there will definitely be C and even B influences. And so the ability to figure out, you know, this is, is this a conscious influence? Is this just coming from life, um, when we start to do that, when we start to become aware, when we start to separate them, things begin to change within us. Um, but if a man in receiving these influences begins to discriminate between them and put on one side those which are not created in life itself, then gradually discrimination becomes easier, and after a certain time, a man can no longer confuse them with the ordinary influences of the life. So, you know, this started out with, uh, you know, the, the, the talk, and whatever, about uh, uh, the misuse of sexual energy, and William wanted to know, um, how can we start to do things correctly? How can we, you know, make sure the intellectual center focuses properly and on the lawful activities of the intellectual center? How can the emotional center focus lawfully on the actions, the lawful actions of the emotional center? And how can we start to correct the functioning of our machine? And he brought in this whole idea of C influences. Um, so, you know, the intellectual center, uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said, uh, is responsible for comparing and contrasting. So you can walk into a supermarket and you compare one apple to another apple and contrast them. And that is the work of the intellectual center. And he gave this as an exercise to his students. Use, you know, become aware of this lawful property of the intellectual center, compare and contrast. Whereas the emotional center, it operates feeling. Do I feel like this apple or this apple? Do I feel like a red apple or do I feel like a green apple? Um, they're both forms of intelligences. They're both brains. 
and learning to discriminate the work and activity of the intellectual center and comparing and contrasting uh, as opposed to the feeling center. Do I like this or dislike this is one way we can begin to sort out the uh, differences and begin to lawfully work with those centers. This question takes it to something deeper. This is really a question for people, or not a question, but this is more of an understanding. This will resonate more with those of us who are drawn to these teachings. We're drawn to these teachings because we have a magnetic center, because something in us has begun to orient towards conscious influences. Uh, I describe the magnetic center metaphorically as a lodestone in our heart. And a, a lodestone was a crude compass. It was a magnetized rock hanging on a string. And, uh, you know, I've often shown a picture of Galileo's lodestone uh, on Facebook. And it's like we have this lodestone that eventually attracts us to see influences. And the stronger and uh, 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 a more attuned the magnetic center grows and the magnetic center is part of the higher part of the emotional center it's it's contained within the emotional center at the highest part we begin to attune to conscious influences and it becomes easier to discriminate conscious influences you know after a certain time which is what mr gurdjieff is saying here in this passage the result of influences whose source lies outside life collect together within him. He remembers them together, feels them together. They begin to form within him a certain whole. He does not give a clear account to himself as to what, how, and why. Or if he does give an account to himself, then he explains it wrongly. But the point of this, the point is not in this, but in the fact that the result of these influences collect together within him, and after a certain time, they form within him a kind of magnetic center, which begins to attract to itself kindred influences, and in this manner it grows. If the magnetic center receives sufficient nourishment, and if there is no strong resistance on the part of the other sides of a man's personality, which are the result of influences created in life, the magnetic center begins to influence a man's orientation, obliging him to turn round and even to move in a certain direction. And I, I'm making the assumption that uh, those, you know, in this online group, those who are watching this, either on Facebook, or on YouTube, who are drawn to Mr. Gurdjieff's teachings, are drawn to these teachings, because of our magnetic center. And the word magnet is important. There's a magnetic quality that pulls us towards them. And it also pulls us out of normal life. I know that there were times in uh, you know, my early part of uh, you know, my quest in my 20s and 30s, that why can't I be normal? Why do I have to go to the spiritual side of life? Why can't I just get a normal job and do normal things? But I couldn't. Every time I tried, I would be yanked away. It would be, I'd be pulled with this, this force from inside me that would make me, you know, yearn to study these teachings, yearn to uh, come under conscious influences, yearn to learn more about this. And it took me away from the law of accident. It took me out of life itself, so to speak. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, for those of you who are really caught up in these teachings, you know what I'm talking about. Um, once something becomes activated within you, once that magnetic, magnetic center has a sufficient energy and coherence, a normal life, 
is impossible. You might as well just give up trying to lead a normal life, just succumb, follow this lodestone in your heart, this, this, this force in the higher part of your emotional center, and allow it to orient you to those influences which come from outside of life. When the magnetic center attains a sufficient force in development, a man already understands the idea of the way, and he begins to look for the way. The search for the way may take many years and may lead to nothing. This depends upon the conditions, upon circumstances, upon the power of the magnetic center, upon the power and the direction of inner tendencies which are not concerned with the search and which may divert a man at the very moment when the possibility of finding the way appears. And so here he's saying that, you know, a magnetic center might not be strong enough at the beginning. And it can also pick up a confusing signal and, you know, connect to a confusing signal that's not really a conscious influence. Um, this is one of the reasons why I'm so glad the first real mystical teaching that I encountered was the Gurdjieff teaching. Because um, I believe that this is a result of sea influences. There's something living beyond living. There's something above life uh, that are contained within these teachings and that they were embodied in Mr. Gurdjieff, but not just in him. He was always pointing at the teachings. He didn't want people to get too in awe of him. It was the teachings that were the thing that he came to bring to the West. And within these teachings, I believe there are immense conscious influences. But I've met people who were interested in the Gurdjieff teachings, and then they've kind of fallen to the wayside. Something wasn't strong enough in them that kept them oriented towards the conscious influences. They, it hadn't coalesced. It, all these threads hadn't come together. And so they, you know, were parts of groups for two, three, five years, and then kind of fell out of it in normal life. Some of them have the fortunate opportunity to come back a bit later in life when they're older and they begin to realize the importance and some never return. That magnetic center within them wasn't strong enough or it had been sort of incorrectly tuned to not the right influences. Um, if the magnetic center works rightly and if a man really searches or even if he does not search actively yet feels rightly he may meet another man who knows the way and who is connected directly or through other people with a center existing outside the law of accident from which proceed the ideas which created the magnetic center world 48 the mechanical realm of normal human beings is the realm of the law of accident I believe the law of fate is actually world 24 and the outside of life where the way starts is world 12. I'll be talking a bit about this later. Um, here again, there are many possibilities, but this will be spoken of later on. For the moment, let us imagine that he has met a man who really knows the way and is ready to help him. The influence of this man upon him goes through his magnetic center. And then at this point, the man frees himself from the law of accident. This is what must be understood. The influence of the man who knows the way upon the first man is a special kind of influence, differing from the former two, first of all, in being a direct influence, and secondly, in being a conscious influence. Influences of the second kind, which create the magnetic center, are conscious in their origins, but afterwards they are thrown into the general vortex of life 
are intermixed with the influences created in life itself and are equally subject to the law of accident. So to be able to distinguish between these two and to recognize that, you know, when they're thrown out into life, they can get totally subsumed and, and lose their potency and lose their power. Um, um, influence of the, of the third kind, that is C influences, can never be subject to the law of accident. They are themselves outside of the law of accident and their actions also outside the law of accident. Influences of the second kind can proceed through books, through philosophical systems, through rituals. Influences of the third kind can only proceed from one person to another directly um, by means of oral transmission. The moment when the man who is looking for the way meets a man who knows the way is called the first threshold or the first step. From this first threshold, the stairway begins. Between life and the way lies the stairway. Only by passing along the stairway can a man enter the way. In addition, the man ascends the stairway with the help of a man who is his guide. He cannot go up the stairway by himself. The way begins only where the stairway ends. That is after the last threshold on the stairway, on a level much higher than the ordinary influences of life. Therefore, it is impossible to answer the question, from what does the way start? The way starts with something that is not in life itself, and therefore it is impossible to say from what. Sometimes it is said, in ascending the stairway, a man is not sure of anything. He may doubt everything, his own powers, whether what he is doing is right, the guide, his knowledge, and his powers. At the same time, what he attains is very unstable. Even if he has ascended fairly high on the stairway, he may fall down at any moment and have to begin again from the beginning. But when he has passed the last threshold, and enters the way this all changes. First of all, all doubts he may have about his guide disappear, and at the same time his guide becomes far less necessary to him than before. In many respects, he may even be independent and know where he is going. Secondly, he can no longer lose so easily the results of his work, and he cannot find himself again in ordinary life. Even if he leaves the way, he will be unable to return to where he started from. This is almost all that can be said in general about the stairway and about the way because there are different ways. We have spoken of this before. And for instance, on the fourth way, there are also, there are special conditions which cannot be on the other ways. Thus the conditions for ascending the stairway on the fourth way are that a man cannot ascend to a higher step until he places another man upon his own step. The other in his turn must be put in his place a third man in order to ascend higher. Thus the higher man, the man ascends, the more he depends on those who are following him. If they stop, he also stops. Such a situation as this may also occur on the way. A man may attain something, for instance, some special power, and may later on sacrifice these powers in order to raise other people to his level. If the people with, him, with whom he is working ascend to this level, he will receive back all that he has sacrificed. But if they do not ascend, he will lose it all together. Um, so, I mean, I went through quickly because we're kind of running out of time. Um, one thing I want to say, accompanying this, let me bring this back, um, is Uspensky's diagram. Uh, and I've mentioned many times Uspensky was a bit of a fool. This diagram, when I first came across it, I was I wanted to understand it so deeply. And it's completely misleading. It's his own wiseacring 
you know, out, you know, he actually showed G this this diagram, but G didn't really respond. So, you know, the circle is life. H is an individual man. There's the A influences and the B influences. And, um, you know, then there's a, something the center created outside of life. And this is all a misunderstanding. Um, Bennett. And again, you know, a, a, a lot of what I understand came from Bennett, particularly energies. But Bennett wanted to, like, recreate the system in his own image. So instead of talking about hydrogen 1, hydrogen 3, hydrogen 6, hydrogen 12, 24, 48, the, the red I've put in here, um, this comes from Deeper Man. He put them E1, E2. And then he also flips around the objective and subjective, and he makes a, a compelling case for why he does this, but he misses an understanding of something. But here, in this, is the idea that certain energies are living energies and the higher energies are beyond life. Um, conscious energies in the system start at the level of a world 12, hydrogen 12. He's got it starting with hydrogen 6, coming from the lowest level of the Godhead, the holy denying. So a C influence is an influence that starts above life, above that threshold between world 24, which is the mindful realm, the realm of personal consciousness, the realm of self-reflectivity. The C influences, you know, we can locate them on the map. And then when they enter into life, they become B influences. So this diagram from Deeper Man by Bennett, you know, talks about the material, um, the living, and the cosmic. Sorry, my phone's going off somewhere, but it's not near me where I can turn it off. Um, I've redone this in terms of the diagram that I use. C influences are the 12 influences, the conscious energy, hydrogen 12. So over on the diagram here, over on the left, let me uh, get a drawing tool. Over here, you know, they're listed as the angels. Here, the awake man. Um, and then in terms of the ray of creation, the solar realm. So when we're talking about sea influences, we are talking about influences that come from either the angelic realm, the realm of the awakened man, or the solar realm in terms of the ray of creation. They are outside of life. They are above life. These are the higher influences. Life goes up to this uh, red line here. You know, this is the realm of life. Um, and Bennett actually said more from plants up. So this area here, in here, is the realm of life. Conscious influences, if we go over to the left side, come from above. They come from awakened human beings, the angelic realm, the solar realm of the ray of creation, and then they can come into life. Um, let me just try and put those things aren't going away. I'm going to just stop sharing this. Um, another thing that has uh, plagued people, what does this mean? Um, Mr. Gurdjieff has, you know, love, hope, and faith. Conscious love evokes the same in response. Emotional love evokes the opposite. Physical love depends on type and polarity. And here he's talking about love at the level of the solar angelic awakened realm of the conscious man 
of world 12 is conscious love. Emotional love evokes the opposite. Here he's talking about the love, the highest love in life at the realm of uh, world 24, the mindful realm, the planetary realm, and physical love, world 48, um, the realm of mechanical humanity. Uh, hope when bold is strength. Hope with doubt is cowardice. Hope with fear is weakness. Again, world 12, world 24, world 48. Or hope that is fueled by hydrogen 12, conscious hope. Hope that is fueled by hydrogen 24, that personally conscious, self-reflective, mindful hope. Or the mechanical hope of regular life. And then conscious faith is freedom, emotional faith is slavery, mechanical faith is foolishness. So here, you know, conscious faith is a conscious influence. It's a C influence. As that conscious faith moves down, the ray of creation, as it gets more dense, as it moves down those levels, it becomes more and more subject to the rule of accident. So to understand, you know, what he meant by conscious influences, they're the higher influences. They come from human beings who are centered in world 12. Those are human beings who are awake, conscious human beings. I fully believe that Mr. Gurdjieff was a conscious human being. And so everything that he sent out into the world was a conscious influence. Um, in Search of the Miraculous, it was written by Uspensky uh, from notes that he took after the meetings that he had with Mr. Gurdjieff. Uh, the parts of In Search of the Miraculous that are absolutely outstanding are the parts in quotation marks, quoting Mr. Gurdjieff. The parts like that diagram that Uspensky came up with are really more uh, of the B influences that came from his relationship with Mr. Gurdjieff. I believe that Beelzebub Tales to his grandson is a conscious influence. But if we're not at the level to receive it all properly, it can get distorted in life and it can become a B influence and then even potentially drift into an A influence. Um, I believe the Bible itself, particularly the, not just particularly the Tanakh, the whole Bible, including the New Testament, um, I believe it was the product of a mystery school. It may not have been written by God, but it had been written by men who were awake and conscious and they set it out into life. And then some people reacted at the right way and other people distorted it. So, um, you know, this coming back in the last few minutes to William's sort of question, um, you know, not, not only do we have to avoid misusing C12, sexual energy through imagination and daydreaming and, you know, all of the other things, we have to start properly using the intellectual center, properly using the emotional center. And again, Mr. Gurdjieff gave exercises, you know, to go, you know, my take on it is to go into a grocery store and compare and contrast things. Uh, you know, this is red, this is green. And then to go in and use your feelings. Do I feel like this or feel like that? Um, he said the instinctive center. The way it operates is the awareness, say, of green. There is no like or dislike to the color green, to something that we see. That like or dislike comes from the emotional center. And the intellectual center, it's the ability to discriminate, you know, compare and contrast. So we can begin to do these exercises use the intellectual center for what it was designed for, use the emotional center 
for what it was designed for. The emotional center is a brain. There's an intelligence to our feelings. To listen to the intelligence of our feelings is to begin to work in the right way. And also, once we have a magnetic center, to sort of supercharge it, to become aware of it, to allow it to lead us in whatever way it can to various conscious influences. And I believe these teachings that came from Mr. Gurji are conscious in their origins. Not just these teachings, because Mr. Gurji also understood the limitations of words. So these teachings, he embedded them in the music, the over 200 compositions that he created with Thomas de Hartmann. And Thomas de Hartmann was the uh, court composer for the Tsar, uh, Tsar Nicholas. Um, so Thomas de Hartmann, uh, Mr. Gurdjieff would hum, play a few notes, and then Thomas de Hartmann would arrange it. And within that music, you can find the teachings. There's a, you know, holy reconciling, you know, the, the, the holy affirmation, holy, you know, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. There are, there are music to that. There's all sorts of names of songs that hint at the teachings. He also embedded these teachings in the movements, uh, in the sacred temple dances that he brought to his students, and in particular, the 39 uh, Gurdjieff movements. I remember years ago uh, doing the Enneagram movement, and through my own exploration of the Enneagram, I realized that there was a certain point where things seemed to reverse themselves. And at that exact point in the dance, everything just seemed to reverse itself. So if you really want to understand the Enneagram, look at the Enneagram, look at the picture, work on it with your intellectual center. And if you're lucky enough, Find a movements instructor and get them to teach you the Enneagram dance. And this way, you will not just be working with your head brain, looking at it. You'll be working with your body brain, with the movements. And the movements were all designed as well to open us up to new and specific feelings. So you'll be doing a dance, and then suddenly you go, wow, by doing this movement, I'm feeling a feeling. So not only did he embed the teachings and the intellectual teachings, the best place to find them is in In Search of the Miraculous. But after he embedded them in Uspensky's mind and knew that the notes were there, he stopped that form of teaching. And then he went on to teach through the movements, through the music, and through other ways. He also said that not only was he embedding the teachings in his works like Beelzebub tales to his grandson, but he embedded them in the mind of his students. And he encouraged all of his students to write about what he had taught them. And for me, the, the information that came from Mr. Gurdjieff is incredible. And the information that came from his students in the forms of their writings, um, you know, Catherine Hume and uh, uh, um, uh, right, C.S. Knott and um, uh, the, my boyhood with Gurdjieff, Fritz Peters, all of those contain important information, especially when they're quoting him. And there's so much of this that, you know, we can attenuate and attune to. And the more we do it, the more we accumulate these influences, the more this pulls us out of life. And it's not out of life, it's out of life. It's not sideways, it's up. And the more we connect with those higher influences. Um, now there's a question that Ian had on um, the, you know, the, the, the misuse of sexual energy and sexual energy. And uh, um, I'm going to get to that at the next meeting. And then the meeting after that, I'll do music. Um, so we're out of time today. Um, I had to rush it a bit at the end. Um, but, uh, you know, all of us here, we're no longer under the law of accident. We have something within us, something magnetic that is drawing us towards these teachings. And the more we empower that part within us, and it's higher part of the emotional center, 
the more powerful it becomes. And it pulls us to the correct alignment, so to speak. So just follow that higher part of your heart and uh, thank you. Um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, you'll think more about this this week and just allow yourself to tune into those higher um, energies. We're moving outside of life. We have that connection, hopefully, with Mr. Gurdjieff in these teachings. So I'd like to thank you for being here today. Um, I, sorry, I had to get, you know, try to get it all into a single meeting, so I had to talk a bit faster and cover a lot more material, but uh, um, bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thanks.